Good evening all, and welcome. The brave men and women of the armed forces have seen a number of horrific things, which I'm about to share with you. It's time to get uncomfortable. Grab your blanket, trigger warning, and let the darkness take control. I was by myself in the engine room of a submarine on the mid-watch, just a newly reported sailor trying to find equipment so that I could display my knowledge to one of the watchstanders. There are a number of bays in the engine room lower level with narrow passages that pass through the center. I came down one of the ladders and I swore I saw someone walking across the ship about 15 feet in front of me. I could hear his footsteps as he walked around the corner and out of sight. Three problems. One, he was wearing utilities, an older light blue blouse, and dark navy slacks. Nobody has utilities anymore. They had been phased out three years earlier. Two, there was only one other person awake in that engine room that late at night, and he was standing at the top of the ladder behind me, waiting for me to come up with the answer to his question. Three, he wasn't actually there. I wrote it off as sleep deprivation, but I'll admit, it shook me for a while. Fast forward to four months later, I had gone out to sea with another submarine of the same type. While I was there, I met a sailor who had previously served on my ship. After a few weeks of standing watch with him, he told me a story of a sailor who had committed suicide while on watch when he served on my ship almost a decade earlier, in the engine room, in his utilities. I wish I could have gotten a picture of the look on my face. I'm sure it was the definition of disbelief. I'd like to share with you an extract from my grandpa's memoir. It goes like this. There was an incident during my time stationed in Guam back in the 1960s. I'm unable to explain very well. One day we got a call from a farmer claiming that something fell from the sky and landed on his farm. We knew no US satellites had gone down, so it was most likely Russian. We get out there to discover this small object. It was about the size of a baseball, completely clear and on one side, it had a waffle-like imprint on it, as if it were attached to a grid. Physically, it felt like glass. We didn't know what to do with it, and one of our officers was an astronomer, so we presented it to him. He kept it as a paperweight. One day while speaking to him, I accidentally knocked the object off his desk, and it looked like it was cracked and about to shatter to pieces. About five minutes or so after, the object was clear again. All the cracks were gone. We struck it a few times again just to watch the object fix itself. I ended up telling my buddies about it, and they wouldn't believe me. When the officer was off base one day, we snuck into his quarters and took the object. Everyone then proceeded to try and break it, but it would keep fixing itself. We stopped doing this when someone had thrown it so hard it bounced off the cement and dented one of our fighter jets. Word about the object spread quickly. The local base newspaper even did a story on our incident, after the officer reluctantly allowed it. Days later, some men purporting to be from Weapons Bureau showed up on base. Not only did they confiscate the object, but they tore through our quarters in order to find every issue of the newspaper which was printed. After that, we were told everything we had seen and read were classified, and to this day, I'm unable to explain the object's unique properties. I'm a military police officer in the US Army, and have had a few weird and spooky things happen to me on my shift. One, I was stationed at Fort Riley for my first few years. It's one of the oldest forts in the Army and was the last stop for people heading west in the old frontier days. Half the post is from that time with buildings made of limestone blocks. I've heard talk that limestone gives paranormal activity more power, but I digress. There's a house there known among the military personnel as the Asbestos House. Supposedly, there was a lieutenant that lived there during the Vietnam era, and he'd snapped 
killing his entire family and hang himself in the basement. The army cleaned it up, and a few years later, another lieutenant was living there and killed his family and himself in exactly the same way. The army hasn't had anyone live there since due to the asbestos, or that's what they say. The issue was that if there were asbestos in the house, every house in that street would have been contaminated as well. But this is the only one that had asbestos in it, according to the army. We'd always get calls to the area, though. The neighbors would hear noises and see lights go on and off, despite no one having lived there for over 30 years. We'd go in to investigate, only to find no one there, and no signs of anyone being there, apart from our own boot prints in the dust from prior investigations. The whole area gave off a really weird energy. My second story is from Fort Riley, which has two main roads leading from older parts of Post to the newer division parts, where the division headquarters and most unit buildings are. One is called First Division Road, and I can't recall the other one where this incident took place. Both these roads have really thick forests on both sides, as well as steep hills. So one day I'm called back to the station to take a statement for a missing person report. A guy comes in and says his wife has gone missing and hasn't been in contact with anyone for a few days. I take his statement and file the report. Fast forward a few months and we get a call for a car wreck off the road whose name I can't remember. An infantry company had been doing a ruck march for morning practice when they smelled something rotten. They did a quick search of the area and found a car wreck off the hill in the forest. We arrived on the scene and found out it was the missing wife. I don't know if you've ever seen a mummy without its wrappings, but that is what this body looked like. The smell was indescribable. The body had bloated and popped all over the inside of the car, and we could only identify the lady because of her ID. As patrols, our primary mission was to just secure the scene and wait for the military police to arrive and investigate. Eventually, they found that the woman had been driving drunk, flew off the road and hit a tree in midair, killing her. The car fell at just the right angle off the road that you wouldn't have seen it unless you were out of your vehicle and actively looking for it. She had been there through most of the Kansas summer and was practically skeletal at this point. It was definitely one of the worst cases I've ever seen. A third story. A few friends from my unit and I were talking about paranormal activity, so we decided to try and do some EVP recordings like we saw on TV. My friend Sergeant Cummings had a high quality microphone since he streams games on Twitch and we used that. We went into the basement of the barracks and set up our little outpost and tried to contact spirits. The standard, hello, is anyone there? And questions like you see on TV. We kept at it for around an hour and a half before we called it a night and went upstairs to go to bed. The next day Cummins called me and said, Mac, you've got to hear this. So I came by and he's isolated several audio clips that we believe to be genuine EVPs. It was so hard to make out, but the three words we heard were Army, Society, and Mississippi. The last one still gives me chills to think about. Why? Cummings was from North Dakota, and I from Mississippi. I was in the National Training Center at one of the military's training facilities. There are mock towns and villages here, some rumored to be haunted, which may be true. My platoon and I spent the night at one of these mock towns due to rain and flooding at night. I forgot to mention this is a desert with mountains and hills. Well, we took shelter from the rain in a building that was quite lengthy, and it was two stories and had an upstairs patio that also led to more stairs to the roof. As we explored the building as we had nothing else to do, we see furniture and a bit of flooding upstairs and downstairs. After a while, we go to bed, and a lot of us were sleeping in the entrance room and five of our soldiers were sleeping in a room towards the back of the building. Come midnight, 30-ish of us 
were awoken by some loud slamming noises that came every three minutes or so. Mind you, there was no wind because all the doors and windows were shut. There's also no electricity in these buildings, so no aircon. The slamming noise goes on for some time, but let me tell you that someone screamed out in anger and all abruptly it stopped for a minute. Then, a lot of heavy sliding upstairs began to happen. The noise was loud, very loud, as if someone or something was pulling furniture or anything heavy around. No one had the guts to go check it out, because as we always say, that's how they die in the movies. I was stationed at Redstone Arsenal, Huntsville, Alabama, September 24th, 1989 in the Advanced Individual Training Program for Ammunition Specialists. We were sent into the field for our field training exercise later that day in the pouring rain. My battle and I set up our tent at the end of the line, which was located near the edge of the wood line. This was around 8 p.m. Later that night at about 2.30, I awoke up and needed to piss. The rain had stopped and the moon was full and made the field by my tent look blue. As I was urinating, I noticed I wasn't the only one up. I looked into the field and saw a young girl between the ages of five and seven running up the trail towards me. I watched her run past and up the trail into the dark forest. Thinking I must be dreaming, I slipped back into my tent and fell right back to sleep. The next morning I was awoken for duty, and like most men, had to once again relieve myself. I went to the same place as before, and as I was relieving myself, remembered what I had seen that night. I looked into the direction I saw the girl come from, and looked to where I'd seen her run off to. There, up the trail, was a Civil War cemetery. I was totally taken aback, and was telling my battle what I'd witnessed. Other trainees listened and gave their opinions, which was mostly disbelief but one of the NCOs nearby heard me and came right over. He asked me to describe the girl and what time it was. Boy, was he mad. He said that the girl haunts the base and all the years he'd be stationed there, he'd never seen her. Everyone got quiet and walked away. That night, I had fire guard duty by myself and no one else wanted to do it with me. I am a skeptic. I still think there are plenty of logical explanations to my story. But that being said, if ghosts are real, that would be the best explanation I could think of. So let's get on with the story. I'm taking you back to summer of 2013. I was a Marine deployed to the Hamland province of Afghanistan. I was in the southern part of the province, attached to the platoon of combat engineers, who in turn were directly supporting the 2nd Battalion 8th Marines, so upwards of a couple of hundred Marines. My platoon of 42 Marines, therefore, had a lot of freedom, as we weren't directly subjected to the battalion commander of the 2 to 8, and we had our own lot, command operations centre, motor pool, maintenance bay, armoury, even a volleyball court. We shared a lot with the Explosive Ordnance Disposal, who were way out on the end of the lot. We never really spoke to them, but they were super chill guys, I heard. We'd come out with our respective infantry companies operating. Usually, one squad would stay back on Dwyer to man the COC and relax and stock up on cigarettes and dip, as well as sleep in a container with a bed and aircon. I personally hated it. I liked getting nitty gritty and living in the dirt and got really bored when I was there, but the gym was sick. Anyway, I'm going to guess sometime in late July or August, I'd been out with the two infantry companies for months back to back, and they gave me a month on Dwyer. A death by boredom sentence, if you ask me. The rest of my platoon was out on a mission up far north, with my squad hanging back in Dwyer. So it was my night for Firewatch, and I was there with my senior Corporal W, and our platoon guide, Sergeant D. We were at the Control Operations Center on our lot. Now I know there's a lot of descriptions going on, but our Control Operations Center was a long wooden structure called an SWA hut. 
It was in the northeast corner of our lot, which was surrounded by a big 15 to 20 foot tall chain link fence with barbed wire atop of it. The space between the center and the fence was no more than 20 feet from the north part of the corner, and from the east part of the corner, more like 35 to 40, not very big at all. We basically squeezed into the corner. On the other side, we had some tents put up because sometimes our sister company dog handlers would come and stay the night, so it was mainly for them. So I was at the end of the SWA hut, right by the door opposite of the other door by the other side. You could see straight through the other side of the SWA hut, maybe 50 feet from one end to the other. It was late at night. Corporal W and Sergeant D and I were smoking some cigarettes and chatting, which was rare as they were higher ranks than me. But most of that stuff washes away towards the end of deployment. I can't remember what we were talking about, but we were looking at the center, which had all the lights on, and out of the other end we see someone walk past the door very casually. I remember him being Caucasian, having a trimmed beard, and wearing a boonie, and having an M16. So we pop into action mode and go looking for this person. Sergeant D went to the north side of the 20 inch space between the center and the fence, the side the guy we saw walking towards. Corporal W went through the command operations center and I went round the southern part. All in all, we linked up on the other side where we first saw the guy not 10 seconds later. As we had sprinted there, it was that quick. There was no one there. We didn't encounter anyone. Sergeant D would have seen the guy. He literally ran into where he was walking. I highly doubt the guy could have jumped a 20 foot fence and vanished. I looked out into the emptiness outside our lot, through the part of the fence he was walking towards and saw nothing, just open desert. We each checked every tent, no one, not a soul. When we met up outside the control center where we saw the guy, I remember he was wearing tri-color camis, which unless you are Marsoc, Marine Special Forces, you don't have them, and they're woodland green. This guy had desert tricolors, invasion era camis from 2001. When I told them this, we all kind of looked at each other like, did we actually see a ghost? Corporal W, having a good sense of humor, said to me, well, I'm going to bed, have fun here alone by yourself, and then leaves. And I didn't hear anything or see anything else after that although we shared a lot with some military contractors. One of them just popped in to hang out for a bit randomly, and it made me feel a little bit better. I eventually went to sleep that night because I thought, screw it, if that thing kills me, then it's gonna kill me when I'm not tired. But I never saw the ghost again, and we never spoke of it. It's not like some secret we all buried, it just never crossed our minds and we brushed it off and forgot about it until recently. But the one thing that strikes me is oddly coincidental is that our command operations center caught fire and burnt to the ground one day and a week or so later. The fire started in the same spot we saw the dude walking to and where he disappeared. It could have been EOD, but the speed of which we covered the amount of ground only to not see anyone and the uniform he was wearing are the only two things that makes it very possible that it were a ghost, if such a thing of course were to exist. One of my drill sergeants actually has a creepy story from one of his Afghanistan deployments. He was infantry, so being in the field and out of missions for a few weeks wasn't uncommon. One night while sleeping in a fighting position he dug, he felt something nibbling at his feet. He woke up and kicked it off, and what he saw wasn't any type of marsupial, but a little humanoid figure he could only describe as looking just like Gollum. But being in the field with little sleep, he chalked it up to seeing things. A few days later, he and another guy on watch, the other guy, pointed out something and said, what the hell is that? And pointed at a stow wall in the distance. My drill sergeant looked through his binoculars, and crawling across the top of the stone was the exact little humanoid creature he had encountered nights before. I was living on Camp Lejeune for a spill. One night we went out to Camp Johnson and decided to walk through the forestry area of the base. 
Upon walking, we kept hearing screams and seeing weird things such as orbs. And there was just this overbearing feeling of, well, I can't really explain it. We ended up walking off the path, and that's when we see a woman dressed in white. It was very scary, and I couldn't move any further. So I did the only logical thing and ran. Later, I found out that me and my group of friends were not the only ones who had seen the lady in white. I used to work in defense programming robots. I was stationed at an army depot in the Nevada desert, and we had a four-wheeled robot we were building to guard the bunkers there. We were never told exactly what was in the bunkers, but I can only assume that they were nukes and aliens. Anyway, the robot had a cluster of cameras on it, including an infrared camera. The infrared was really fun to play with at night. It sensed heat, so you could spot coyotes, rattlesnakes, rabbits, and other desert creatures. One morning I walked into our office, and everyone was crowded round the video console, watching the robot's recorded video from a few hours before. The video started with the robot's usual night drive, its mindless route. Then it picked up something on radar, sounded his alarm and sped over to the radar blip to get a bit closer. When he got there, he pointed his color camera, but there was nothing there. He pointed his infrared, and that's when it got scary. There was a ghost standing in the desert in front of the robot. He looked like an old World War II soldier. He was in uniform, with a rifle and a German Shepherd. The robot kept toggling between the color camera and the infrared, and thus the ghost kept disappearing and coming back. Clearly the robot was confused as well. I'm pretty sure the ghost was confused too. Eventually the ghost decided he had better things to do, so he left. The robot then resumed his mindless route. Just another day in nowhere Nevada. As a Marine, I used to have the graveyard patrol shift at the Beirut Bombing Memorial. Part of the memorial is dedicated to a veteran cemetery. Oddly enough, I never got freaked out being completely alone in a remote cemetery in the middle of the night, surrounded by dense wood on all sides. It was actually kind of peaceful, to be honest. However, one night, I was patrolling near the perimeter fence where some of the oldest headstones are, and I heard the sound of a woman humming. I followed the sound and noticed a light glowing through the vines and brush of a large tree. As I approached, I could literally feel my hair begin to lift as if there were an electric current in the air. I pushed aside the brush and what I saw next nearly took my breath away. It was an old weathered headstone with a large cross etched into the marble. Only the cross was glowing a bright vivid blue like a neon bulb. The humming was also suddenly much louder and had a weird plurality to it, like it was coming from hundred voices at once. Needless to say, I freaked the hell out, screamed like a scared little girl and sprinted back to the parking lot. I radioed the guard who was supposed to relieve me and forced him to come early, then spent the rest of my shift in the cab of his truck. I don't think he believed me, but he stayed in his truck and didn't go out on patrol until the sun was fully up. A few days later, I worked up the nerve to return to the graveyard during the day. As I suspected, in the light of day, it was a completely mundane headstone. There was no name, only the aforementioned cross. I ran my hands over the stone to check to see if there was maybe some sort of hidden light source or solar panel, but none. It was just plain, solid, unremarkable stone and the humming was gone too. I eventually returned to my normal shift, but never again experienced anything out of the ordinary. I never learned whose grave that was either, but I find myself thinking about it from time to time. It certainly sounds absurd when I say it out loud, but I suppose it could have been a hallucination or a trick of my brain, but I don't believe it was. I think it was a real ghost or spirit of some sort, but I don't think it was malevolent in the slightest. I was on one rooftop, on post, with another marine, and on the building next to mine was a dude smoking a cigarette. I looked at my partner and mentioned it, but when we looked again he was gone. The roof access door for that building was very rusty and loud, 
so there's no way he snuck out in those few seconds. So, I don't understand how he just vanished into nothingness. I used to work on a submarine. There are few things as unnerving and wondrous about the engine room, from 2300 to 0500, alone on watch. When the boat is largely shut down in port, it becomes very quiet. The roving watchers usually make it an hourly game to speed through their log rounds, especially in the lower levels. One particular in port period, the boat was moored in Pearl Harbor, and a few people started complaining about feeling really uneasy. I was on mid-watch as the SEO on evening and senior chief came back to do his required 3 a.m. tour. We saw him walk past, maneuvering on his way to Shaft Alley. That particular senior chief was the crusty old salty type and would usually spend a bit of time just sitting in the lower levels of the engine room alone to contemplate life, so we expected as much. What we didn't expect was to him to literally run into the maneuvering area a few minutes later. The man was pale-faced and breathing heavily. We sat up straight, our eyes wide, thinking he was about to have to announce and fight some ship casualty. He slumps into the Edo chair. A few tense but silent moments go by. We're on pins and needles, he finally opens his mouth to tell us he saw a ghost in the shaft alley. Swears a sailor passes by him as he's sitting on trash in the shaft alley. His first response was to call out to the guy to see who it was, but then he realized he wasn't dressed right. He describes what the guy was wearing, the old World War II naval uniforms. So he quickly gets up and catches up to the guy. And he does, catches him all the way up. The guy turns towards the senior chief, looks right at him, then turns away and literally walks through the arse end of the boat. It's now that the senior chief decides it's time to leave Shaft Alley, and promptly does so, swearing up and down that he knows what he saw. I sure as hell wasn't about to leave maneuvering that night to find out for myself. I was a young sergeant in 2006, stationed at Fort Bliss, Right outside of Fort Bliss was a training area that was near the Biggs Airfield. We were guarding some equipment overnight, so the company wouldn't have to stay. It was me and one private. I told him he would take shifts patrolling, and since we weren't allowed to have cars out there, the other would nap in his car. I woke up to my soldier knocking on my window in complete panic. It scared me at first. Private. Sergeant, wake up! There's a UFO out there. What? The private points in the direction, and I sure as hell see these lights that seem like they were floating around and then vanishing. Took me a moment as I'd just woken up. That's the Franklin Mountain Range. You're looking at the cars driving on the scenic route. The cars would be visible and then disappear when they rent around the corner, only to turn to appear again when they came back round. I was very agitated at first, but by the next day, it was by far the funniest experience I'd had while at the military. One time I was at an Air Force base in the ROKs and we had a power outage at night. All of us walked out to our hangar doors to see what the problem was and we saw a very large triangular shape passing over our hangar. It was a clear moonless night previously and when we went outside to look we noticed the starscape being covered then slowly uncovered. No sound associated with the event other than the normal sounds of the location, and I'll never forget it. Allow me to preface. At the time I was working nights in the munition storage area, which is fenced off with barbed wire fencing. The whole area is pretty spread out with multiple buildings and definitely large enough that you generally drove around to get to other buildings. Due to the nature of the job, the buildings are spread out with clear spaces between them. Anyway, the only people in the bomb dump on this night are the roughly eight or so of us in my shop and one guy in control that night. He was in another building. 
so we had a direct line to him on what we called the bat phone. This was in summer, around 2 or 3 a.m., and the air was very warm and very still with no breeze at all. And we all had the break room door open while we watched a movie. We were on flight line support standby and nothing was going on. Now the rumor was the small building we worked out of had been built by German prisoners of war during the war. And I know for a fact that there were some back then. It was small, with a main break room, small dispatch office through a doorway, and a couple of offices off that one. There were two doors, one in the break room, and one on the same side of the building in the dispatch office, roughly 20 to 30 feet away from each other. Both had push bars on the inside, but only the break room door could be opened from the outside. As the dispatch door external latch was busted, and only the internal bar worked. While all of us, minus the guy locked down in the control building for security, are in the break room, when suddenly a loud kathlunk, loud as hell from the dispatch door in the next room. It was like someone was rushing through, slammed the push bar, and the door swung open, and then swung back shut after a few seconds with a slam. We looked at each other, and started to check it out. We had mag lights in our crew books, so a few of them grabbed them and swept around the building from both directions. Another guy calls the controller on the bat phone who picks up and denied that he was messing with us. There was no way he could have messed with us and made it back to his phone in time, let alone doing it without being seen or heard. Anyone with experience knows how sound carries at 3 a.m. in summer. You could hear the code keys being pressed hundreds of yards away, no joke. No way he hoofed it back to the building that fast, gone through all those halls, punched in his key code and got back to the phone in seconds. But the thing that got me was the damned bar. The door simply did not open from the outside, and we all heard the bar get pushed in hard. The door swings open, hangs there for a few seconds and shuts. There was absolutely no breeze, and had there been, it would have blown past us, sitting right in front of the door. As an aside, there would be a random time where I would go to pick up a trailer or something behind one of the other shops at the far end of the bomb dump. As soon as I stepped out of my truck to do inventory, I would get a super bad vibe. And I'm talking the heebie-jeebies, like no other. And as best I can describe it, it felt like something was right behind me and just hated me being there, just seething anger, rage, and hate. And it wouldn't go away until about 15 minutes after driving away from that building. One night, another driver who had arrived there shortly before I had a trailer asked if I had a weird feeling there, which I sure as hell did, and he corroborated it. All of this was on mid-shift, which was 11 to 7 a.m. I heard a few other people's stories about weird stuff that would happen at night, but since they're not my stories, I can't vouch. The only other things that happened to me was I swear I caught the clear silhouette of a guy walking in an open field between igloos, as I turned to punch in my gate code in. In the corner of my eye, I distinctly caught the motion of two legs and an arm sticking out, like someone mid-stride, but when I turned back, I saw no one. It might have been my mind playing tricks on me, but man, that place can be creepy. It's been 15 years now, and I still get chills just thinking about it. I was out in the middle of the Pacific on deployment in 2016, in the smoke pit about 1am. Beautiful, clear night, so a bunch of us are watching the stars. There's zero light pollution out there and the sky is amazing at night. There was this one bright light that hadn't moved since we got there, when all of a sudden it flew across the sky super fast, stopped instantly at another point for about 30 seconds before zipping off across the sky making a turn at an impossible speed, the sharpness and zooming off and then disappearing. Everyone up there saw it and were all like, yep, that was a UFO. I got to my first unit in the army after basic combat training and AIT. A buddy from basic got there at the same time and we were put in the same room. The building was about three years old, 
so it was modern, two bedroom, shared kitchen on the left and bathroom on the right. My room and then back to the left. Homie's room back and to the right. His door had this official US Army crime seam tape around the edges. Being curious fresh privates, we asked the senior specialist what it was about, to which they would just skirt around any kind of answer and leave. Fast forward a few months, homies moved into his new platoon hallway, and my Navajo buddy from basic moved in. By this point, the crime scene tape was removed. He's a traditional Navajo, fairly spiritual type, and starts telling me he gets odd feelings from the room. I'm kind of creeped out by it, because of all the tape, but not terribly worried. Fast forward again, probably about a year in the same room. Homie is at an early morning appointment. I wake up and do my pre-private grooming. His door is slightly cracked, which isn't unusual for him. His toothbrush is left by the bathroom sink, which he usually keeps in his room. I don't think anything of it. He must have just been in a rush, I tell myself. I do a solid of putting his toothbrush where it usually sits in his room and leave the door in the same position I found it, about an inch open. I go back to the mirror to start my shave, when in the reflection I see his door slam open, slam closed, slam open, and finally crack about an inch to where it started. I immediately left and got an ass chewing for not shaving. I work at the US Air Force. I'm not allowed to say what I do, but my frame flew in Vietnam and carried dead bodies back, and after Vietnam it was repurposed. All of the older frames from that era are supposedly haunted from dead soldiers. I've spent mid-shift, midnight to 7am on these frames, and I've heard people scream out in pain. I've asked for a tool and had someone hand it to me, and then turn around and they were gone. Multiple times you'll hear someone's name being called. I don't believe in ghosts, but those frames creep the hell out of me. Around 2015, I was in the truck training a new airman on flight line driving at night when we were doing a routine inspection on the equipment out there. He knew what he was doing, so I just stargazed, like I like to. It was a clear night, so it was perfect. After a minute, I noticed the stars were disappearing in clusters and reappearing after a second and realized something really dark and large was gliding over the top of us. I told my co-worker to look at it, and he saw it too. It was this giant crescent-shaped thing just flying silently overhead, west away from the mountains. It was seriously bizarre. I've never seen anything like it before, and still have no idea what it was. I should probably ask him if he remembers it. So I served in the Marines from 2014 to 2016 and did one tour of Afghanistan. My best friend and I, Lance Corporal Sean Trevers, were stationed together in Camp Dwyer for a short amount of time to help with standard survey and watch. One day we went on a route convoy to deliver supplies to a unit about 30 kilometers away. Long story short, we came across a building while a sandstorm was developing towards the west. We were ordered to seek shelter until the sandstorm passed. Now, when I say building, I mean this was a building that looked incredibly out of place. We were essentially in what I would call a small valley, and the nearest village was three to four clicks away. After about ten minutes, we scanned the building and found no civils or combatants. Two marines were outside standing near the wall that was in front of the building, and two were on the roof, while the rest of us ate some chow and were just chatting on the second floor. There were four floors, by the way. Then we heard shots fired. The same over the radio. We scrambled and got our gear. I went to the window, which was next to a door leading to a balcony of sorts. After what seemed like hours, we finally stopped hearing fire and received the cease order. We were told to check ammo and for wounded and to check the eliminated targets. I went to go look out for Sean and couldn't reach him on radio. I looked through the entire building and couldn't find him. I went to my squad leader and I was told he was last seen at the corner wall near the left of the building. I am sorry to say that I did find my friend and called for a call man, 
but was unable to stop the bleeding that was coming from his neck. I did everything I could to keep him alive. I applied pressure and tried to keep him conscious, but unfortunately I had to hold my nearest and dearest friend in my arms as he took his final breaths on earth. I held him for as long as I could before the call man finally told me he was really gone, and I watched over his remains until we got to base. Now that the sad part is told, I can tell you the paranormal part. It's been six years since my friend and fellow brother passed away, and ever since I left country and left the Marines, I've seen him in my dreams. And while I've been awake, I feel like I'm going crazy, but I also feel like it's my PTSD causing me to hallucinate. But I see him not in a bad way sometimes. I see him in dress blues, or Charlie sometimes. I'll occasionally see him with his Texas rodeo, complete with cowboy boots and hat to match, while dripping Copenhagen straight, or while in full combat gear with his M16. One day I was sitting in the kitchen eating dinner with my wife, who was six months pregnant, and I hear clear as day the word, hi, as if someone were inches away from me right near my ear and whispering it. I recently saw him at the grocery store of all places, and he gave me a half salute and walked and faded away. I don't know if he's maybe a sort of guardian angel now watching over me. Either way, I want to feel really open-minded about people's opinions about whether I'm seeing things, or whether I should go lock myself in a nut house. Hey guys, Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories and the video. If of course you did, be sure to let me know in the usual way. You can like, you can subscribe, you can press the bell icon and do all the good stuff. I'm sorry about my voice. Uh, I did say in the secret message section the other day that Pandora brought home a cold, and the cold just keeps getting worse. It's not COVID, I think. Um, different symptoms. But yes, my nose is all blocked and stuffy and disgusting, which is why I don't sound 100%. But it's Monday, and I have to record, so that's what I did. I don't really want to let you guys down. So there you have it. Um, I hope that you enjoyed tonight's video. Please let me know if you did. And I hope to be better by Wednesday. Let me know what I should do if I'm not. Anyway, stay awesome, guys. Stay safe. Huge thank you to my members and patrons whose names can be seen on screen, which is going to be updated soon. So if you don't see your name, don't worry. It will be updated soon. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.